Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual journal club. Um, this morning is um, really uh, and promises to be a truly outstanding program from one of the most esteemed lecturers and um, surgeons in the world of thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer. Um, it's really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Ashok Shaha, who is an attending surgeon at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Having trained at Memorial in surgical oncology and completed a fellowship in head and neck, he became a member of their family uh, and their faculty in 1993. Um, he has truly had a stellar academic career and is both a prolific writer and a speaker. Uh, he has published over 600 papers in peer-reviewed uh, journals on topics related to all aspects of head and neck surgery. However, I think it's easy to say that his true passion relates to the management of thyroid cancer, um, and he is truly um, considered one of the world's leading experts in this field. In addition to his leadership in many national and international societies, um, and it is uh, really impossible in the time allowed for me to go through all of uh, the, the leadership positions that he has held over the years, Ashok has devoted a significant part of his career to his role as a teacher, and he has been highly decorated for his contributions um, as an educator as well as a surgeon. So one of the great things about having the opportunity to introduce um, such uh, remarkable individuals every Friday morning as I get to think about their careers and um, to reflect a little bit about um, what they have, um, what they've contributed. And I must say that in preparing for this morning's introduction, it occurred to me that the mere mention of the name Ashok does not require the addition of his last name in order to understand who you are referring to. And that level of first name recognition is rarely achieved by physicians in any field. And so sure enough, I went to Google and uh, looked at the list of celebrities who are known only by their first name. And sure enough, Ashok is listed with such notaries as Sonny, Cher, LeBron, Serena, Roger, Oprah, and Winona. And um, Ashok is right at the very end of that list, but probably after this morning, he will um, catapult up to the top there. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ashok, who is both a colleague and friend. I encourage you to write in your questions this morning, which I will try to get to at the end of the lecture uh, before that 9 a.m. hour. So with that, um, Ashok, I'm going to turn this over to you and thank you uh, from the very outset for agreeing to um, to give this wonderful lecture. Thank you very much, my, uh, Mark. I appreciate your kind introduction. I wish my wife was here listening to this, or better yet, I wish my son, who is a chief resident in ENT, was listening to this. He thinks I'm the dumbest person in the world, and I think that's the same feeling you may be having inside your heart. In any case, the subject I'm going to discuss today, which is a stage thyroidectomy, is probably one of the most controversial subject in thyroid. And more importantly, it brings us to the understanding of number one, the biology of thyroid cancer. And number two, what is the appropriate and right treatment for patients with low risk thyroid cancer? I want to bring greetings from Memorial, uh, the uh, uh, Memorial Hospital the Outpatient Surgery Unit, and this is the new Coke Center, which is the great building, architectural marvel on the FDR Drive overlooking the uh, East River. So if you look at the word stage thyroidectomy, I think there are many different words. So completion thyroidectomy is probably the most common word we use. Step thyroidectomy, sequential thyroidectomy, stepwise thyroidectomy, some people would call it secondary thyroidectomy. So there are different names and different terms used. Now, I don't have any disclosure. The only disclosure I have is I received the stimulus check yesterday. So I'm very happy about it. My wife is more happy about it. And I told her I'm going to give a talk in Thank Foundation and she's waiting for another check from Thank Foundation. What are, what are we going to discuss this morning? We'll talk a little bit about 
What is the meaning of stage thyroidectomy? What are the indications, the complications, the ADA guidelines? What is the role of RAI? And the most important, what do we do when the patient presents with a paralyzed vocal cord, either in your hand or from somewhere else, or you lost the signal during ipsilateral thyroid lobectomy? Now, just a few months back, uh, Tom Robbins, uh, uh, Ronan, and uh, myself, and few other people around the country wrote a paper in Head and Neck, Case for Stage Thyroidectomy. This is an interesting paper just published last year, and you may want to look at it as to what I'm going to talk today. So when we talk about completion thyroidectomy, what do we mean? It means you're operating on a thyroid nodule without diagnosis of cancer. And the classical example is follicular neoplasm, Bethesda 3 or 4. And that's where the debate starts. You know, you take out a lobe for diagnostic purpose, turns out to be cancer, what do we do now? Now, I'm going to use the term, it's not only diagnostic thyroid lobectomy, in my hands or in our judgment, it is also a therapeutic lobectomy. Most of the time, diagnostic lobectomy is a therapeutic lobectomy, and you don't need to do anything more. Occasionally, you have proven thyroid cancer undergoing lobectomy, and later on, something happens between the patient, the family, endocrinologist, and the surgeon, and wants completion thyroidectomy. The most important indication for completion thyroidectomy is need of radioactive iodine now or in future. Because you cannot give radioactive iodine without taking out the opposite lobe. Um, there are nodules on the other side. And this is very important, preoperative evaluation of a thyroid nodule to make sure the opposite lobe is absolutely normal. If there are nodules on the other side which are growing over a period of time, you may need completion thyroidectomy. And the last but not the least, occasionally the patients will come with no nodal metastasis. At that time, when you are doing a neck dissection, either central compartment or lateral neck, you want to do a completion thyroidectomy to facilitate radioactive iodine. Now, this is a very famous quote. When a thing ceases to be a subject of controversy, it ceases to be a subject of interest. Now, when I'm going to talk about completion thyroidectomy, I'm going to divide the entire talk into two groups. One, completion thyroidectomy, and two, which is more important, which is more debatable, is what is the standard of care in low-risk thyroid cancer? Is it a lobectomy or total thyroidectomy? And approximately about eight months back, I gave this talk here on the Thank Foundation uh, through the Journal Club when Susanna Vargas was presenting her paper. And I did talk some of the uh, philosophy of memorial as to the lobectomy. Now let's go back to the entire debate between lobectomy and total thyroidectomy, and then that will make us understand when do we need a completion thyroidectomy. Keep in mind, in majority of the low-risk patients, the results are equally good with lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. Most of the patients in the low-risk group have excellent prognosis. The role of radioactive iodine is undefined or de-escalize um, uh, or, or de uh, in, in patients with low-risk thyroid cancer. The complications increase with extent of thyroidectomy. Very important to realize there are no prospects to randomized trials in thyroid cancer, especially when it comes to extent of thyroidectomy. And very important to understand the biology and use the biology to manage thyroid cancers in uh, patients with papillary thyroid carcinoma. Now, when I gave a talk about eight months back, many of you probably were there, but I know Shahaz aphorism, only 20% of you will remember 20% of what I said 20 minutes after the lecture. So I feel very privileged to use some of the old slides to discuss the controversy about lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy. Now, this is my favorite slide. I've been using it for the last 25 years. If you look at the Google, you will find every two hours or every six hours, there is one new paper on thyroid tumors. Now, more interesting than that, 
you know, just like Mark looked for me in the Google, the patients with thyroid cancer look for not only the surgeon in Google, but what is the literature on thyroid cancer. And you will see here, there are approximately 20 million sites. What is interesting is every patient who comes to your office knows more about thyroid cancer than we do today. They are well prepared. They know everything. And I don't call this thyroid consultation today. I call it thyroid confrontation. I feel like I'm going for American Board of Surgery exam with the patient asking millions of questions. And then eventually when I don't know the answer, I tell them, please go and see Dr. Arkan. He will answer remaining questions. Let's go back to the philosophy. The purpose of modern treatment philosophy is use cause effective, evidence-based, and optimize the resource utilization and avoid unnecessary treatment. And the reason is avoid over treatment and the over treatment means treatment related complications. And keep in mind, the worst thing in the thyroid is not thyroid cancer, is the complications of surgery. All that new, you need in your career is one patient with nerve palsy or permanent hypoparathyroidism. She will be haunting you for the rest of your life. Now we at Memorial looked at thyroid cancer as a good, bad, and ugly, and all of you are quite familiar with our publications. We were the earliest group to define this intermediate risk group. And again, you will see here the low risk young patient with thyroid cancer. The outcome is 99 to 100%. High risk is the older patient with larger tumor. The survival is not very good. And this is the intermediate risk group, which is a young patient with bad cancer or old patient with good cancer. Now you will see here the statistical difference in the outcome. If we want to put our energy, our all our resources, they should go in the high risk group because that's where we talk about mortality. In the low risk group, there is hardly any mortality, but we love to debate in the low risk group because we love to argue with each other and try to prove that I, my philosophy is more correct than somebody else's philosophy. I'm going to make it very simple. The selection of therapy in thyroid cancer is based on the low risk, the intermediate risk, and the high risk group. In the low risk group, the lobectomy is quite appropriate and complete. In the high risk group, be as aggressive as possible, use adjuvant treatments and new therapies. An intermediate risk group is one group where we use our discretion, be aggressive, but don't hurt the patient more. I think that's the philosophy of managing these patients. The ne next two slides are very important. When you're dealing with a lobectomy, and we're going to talk more about completion thyroidectomy, in the low risk thyroid cancer patient, the preoperative evaluation is very important. Is the tumor less than four centimeters? What are the critical features? It is fixed and hard. But it doesn't matter what is the size of the tumor. You probably will need total thyroidectomy because those patients will be benefited with radioactive iodine. What are the radiological findings? Is it irregular tumor? Is there extra thyroid extension? Uh, are there suspicious nodules on the other side? Let's say there's more than one centimeter nodule on the other side. We know sooner or later that patient will come to surgery and those patients will be benefited by initial total thyroidectomy. Don't forget about the ultrasound and the CAT scan. I think the CAT scan is probably the most important investigation in suspected thyroid cancer to appreciate the extent of the disease in the primary, the lymph node metastasis, and more importantly, is there extra thyroidal extension. And the last but not the least, which is very important, you must have your endocrinologist working with you. The majority of the problems start or they go on because there is a dichotomy of opinion between the endocrinologist and the surgeon. And the patients get confused because they get two different opinions in the same institution. So these are the preoperative factors. 
Let's look at the intraoperative factors. I'm planning a lobectomy or I'm, I'm planning a thyroid surgery. Always consent the patient for total thyroidectomy. So in, in the middle of the operation, you don't have to wake up the patient and say, what do I do? Or go to the family. We already told the patient that if I don't like the tumor, if I find something very abnormal or a heart tumor or fixed tumor, or there are multiple positive nodes, not one or two nodes, but multiple positive nodes, I'm going to go ahead with total thyroidectomy. And I think the patient and the family must understand this. Is there gross extrathyroid extension? Now, don't worry about the anterior extrathyroid extension because those are the strap muscles which invariably we will take without any major concern. I personally like to look at the Delphian node and we just wrote an editorial. I think Delphian node in thyroid cancer to me is a sentinel node just like in melanoma or oral cavity cancer. If the Delphian node is positive, which I commonly look for and get a frozen section, I know there may be paratracheal lymph nodes and I'm more aggressive. If there are multiple suspicious nodes, I would go ahead with total thyroidectomy at the first time. But if you look at our debate, which is going on for last many years, lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy in the lowest group. Take a look here. The outcome is the same. The survival is the same, no matter what surgical procedure we do. Now, we are not debated about this in breast cancer, lumpectomy versus mastectomy. But we do like to debate in thyroid because of the influence of the patient, our colleagues, and our surgical dogma. Now, this is probably one of the most important take home uh, uh, message. The fact that you can do total thyroidectomy without major complications uh, does not mean it is indicated in all patients with thyroid cancer. An operation not worth doing is not worth doing well. So understand the biology of the tumor and adhere to the principles of giving best quality of life to the patient. Are there indications for total thyroidectomy? Absolutely. If there is a high risk patient, if there is a, there are palpable nodes in the neck, if there are nodules on both sides of the thyroid, radiated patient, some young patients with bulky nodal metastasis, because they may have pulmonary metastasis and you won't find it unless you do radioactive iodine. And last but not the least, the patients with familial history of thyroid cancer or familial syndromes such as Cowden's disease and other syndromes may be indications for total thyroidectomy. Now, if you look at the data, and I think it is, I'm not going to use a lot of data to confuse you. Thyroid lecture is one of the most confusing lecture. You can use the data from different parts of the world and confuse the audience. But this is a seer data. Is lobectomy enough from California group? And the answer is yes. If you look at the NCDB data with Julia and Sosa, and again, they looked at the young patients uh, with the extent of thyroidectomy, and there was no outcome difference. Very important to realize. Now, this is my favorite slide. Mark will love this because this gives the entire world literature and the data on thyroid cancer. When you invite a visiting professor, these are the slides they generally use. And norm normally they would say, I'm sorry for the complicated si slide. Most of you probably may not understand. Even I don't understand what I'm talking with this slide. Now, if you look at the ATA guidelines, I think the 2015 guidelines are probably the most important guidelines adhering to the biology of thyroid cancer. And again, you will see here, the thyroid lobectomy is appropriate for tumors below four centimeters, low risk patient, and no central compartment lymph nodes. I think the AT has done a fantastic job on advancing the understanding of biology of thyroid cancer in the last few years. Now, as a corollary to this, this was published by Kim. Um, less is more 
in thyroid cancer. Now, this is important to remember. In thyroid cancer, less is more. I think this, in life, more is always better. More money, more fame, more glory. But in thyroid cancer, as we showed before, less is more. What does it mean? In thyroid cancer, less is better. And this is something that we need to realize. Why is it better? It gives, because it gives the best quality of life to the patients. So we look at our own data from Ian Nixon. This was published a few years back. If you have got a low risk intrathyroidal tumor, take a look here. All the parameters, the local recurrence free survival, neck recurrence free survival, overall survival, disease specific survival, no survival difference, whether you do a lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. And this is something very important. We have been studying this at Memorial over the last 50 years. And here you can see here the p value not significant. Now, if you look at the most recent data from different publications, almost every publication, large database, showed that there is no survival difference except this Bilimoria paper, which was published in Annals of Surgery. And I, again, this is from CDB data. After publication of this paper, there were a lot of editorials, there were a lot of revisiting the NCDB data. And I think Julian did a fantastic job looking at this data again more critically and analyzing the truly low risk group and showed there was no survival difference in patients more than 60,000 in number from NCTB. And this is the data again from Julian and one of her uh, resident, Adam. You see here no survival difference in a large number of patients, 61,000, whether you do a lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. And our philosophy in the management of thyroid cancer, which we have promulgated over the last 50 years, let the punishment fit the crime. I think this is very important. Let's go back to the philosophy or arguments about completion thyroidectomy. What is the main reason? You do a lobectomy, you send it for frozen section, the report comes benign. After five days, the report comes malignant. Now, what do we do? We go back and blame our pathologist. And that is wrong because we know they are not looking at the entire capsule during frozen section. So don't blame the patient and use them. Uh, don't blame the endocrinologist and tell the patient that, sorry, the pathologist gave a wrong answer to us. Now we are changing the diagnosis and you need completion thyroidectomy. That is not correct. Now, interestingly, this is a knee jerk reflux, lobectomy. The minute you get the report, it is cancer, completion, thyroidectomy, and radioactive iodine. Probably this is a knee-jerk reflux all over the United States. It used to be common, but I, again, I'm going to go back to the understanding of biology and the ATA guidelines. We rarely do this today. Now, some 30 years back, I wrote this paper, or actually 33 years back, intraoperative decision making during thyroid surgery and the entire idea of extent of thyroidectomy is based on preoperative planning of surgery the risk group stratification the prognostic factors ages aims misses and the clinical findings at the time of surgery if you put all these in right perspective we can make the appropriate decision about extent of thyroidectomy and avoid completion thyroidectomy as I showed in the previous slide. Good judgment comes from experience, but in life, experience comes from bad judgment. You look at the, all the prognostic factors around the world, and there are almost 17 different prognostic uh, uh, analysis. And these are the main, the Mayo Clinic, the Leahy Clinic, the Memorial, the Karolinska, and this is which is very popular, the Macy's. Nowhere it is written extent of thyroidectomy. The most important prognostic factor is apart from age, the extracellular extension and size of the tumor. The average surgeon confronted with papillary carcinoma can virtually choose any operation 
and find the support for that in the literature. So let's go to the philosophy of completion theoretectomy. What has changed? We now understand the biology very well. We realize there is a similar outcome, but clearly the patients with lobectomy have better quality of life. This, obviously, there is always a concern about treatment anxiety. And what we need is the patient to develop a confidence with the treating physician. And that can come if our philosophy with the endocrinologist and the surgeon is the same. Now, we've got better follow-up strategies with ultrasound. There are no randomized studies except large retrospective studies such as MSKCC data, SEER, and NCBDB data. Now, probably the most important aspect in the discussion of completion thyroidectomy is the post-operative pathological features. And what are those? Is it multicentric thyroid cancer? And this is, brings a lot of discussion. Suppose there are three foci on, of cancer on one side. I'm sure there is one or two focus on the other side. You do a completion thyroidectomy, you look like a brow that I found microscopic cancer on the other side. But does it really matter? 10% of the American population is living with microscopic cancer. They live with cancer, they grow with cancer, and they die with cancer. It doesn't become clinically apparent. The same philosophy, if you had done a lobectomy on one side with multicentric cancer, unless there is something identifiable on the other side, either by ultrasound or by CAT scan. Their gross positive margins. Now, one of the problems in the thyroid is the reports will come many times, positive margin. And there will be always a debate whether the tumor was left behind. Keep in mind, microscopic positive margin or microscopic minimally aggressive cancer or minimal invasion of the surrounding structures has no meaning. It's the gross extent of the disease. Has the surgeon left the tumor behind? What is the histology? Is it tall cell, top nail, diffuse sclerosing, insular, poorly differentiated? Those are the important factors. And the last but not the least, is there major capsular invasion or major vascular invasion, which is more than four foci? I think the data from Japan is very clear. If there are more than four foci, be concerned. Those patients may develop distant metastasis and may not become apparent. There are concerns about the opposite lobe. What is the size of the primary? What is the gross extent of the disease? Are there multiple positive nodes? Are there jugular nodes or lateral neck nodes? What is the status of the opposite lobe? And as I always use the Delphian node positivity as a sentinel evaluation of thyroid. I'm going to take some issues and discuss about that. What about the preoperative BRAF or TURD? Now, very rarely we would do BRAF or TURD in low risk, and very rarely it will be positive. But if it is positive, and you have done it for one or the other reason, then I would be a little more concerned, especially if BRAF and TURD are positive together. If it is BRAF alone, I don't think we worry about it that much if there is an intrathyroidal tumor. Now keep in mind, even though we use molecular testing today, I'm not sure we can use them for decision making. Our clinical parameters are still very important in decision making. What about the quality of life? I'm convinced in my heart that quality of life of patients with lobectomy is much better than total thyroidectomy. Now, we have not done the prospective studies, but whatever has been discussed in the literature on quality of life I'm convinced. Now, some of the patients with lobectomy may need thyroid medication, but keep in mind that is supplement and not 100% replacement. Do not use one size fits all. Use personalized and precision treatment. Make appropriate decisions based on the philosophy of the institution and the philosophy of our endocrinologist and patient's anxiety. What about when the patient presents with lobectomy done outside and has a vocal cord paralysis? The decision making now is totally different. We won't go on the other side for the fear of one or 2% risk of airway problem. 
unless there is a strong indication and it is really going to make an outcome difference in these patients. The same issue when you lose a signal on one side. What do we do? Now, keep in mind, we need to make sure that we have lost the signal because there is some problem with the nerve. If it doesn't come back in 15 to 20 minutes, the standard guidelines, international guidelines, is don't go on the other side. Now you need to make a decision. Suppose you are operating on a thyroid nodule and there are multiple positive nodes or tumor is stuck to the nerve. I would rather go on the other side first because I know the risk of injury to the other side is minimal. And then go on the ipsilateral side where there is a almost 20% risk that you may lose the signal. Now these are the institutional philosophies, individual surgical philosophies. There are several recent publications supporting completion thyroidectomy up to 50%. As a matter of fact, there are three or four publications around the world saying that the ATA guidelines may not be most appropriate because about 50% of the patients will require completion thyroidectomy. But if you read those papers in detail, you'll find the positive margin. That is not a true indication or minimally uh, minimal extrathyroid extension. That's not a true indication for completion thyroidectomy. In our own group, only about less than 10% of the patients required completion thyroidectomy. And most of those were either 5% early or 5% in the follow-up. And most of those were mainly the patient anxiety. Keep in mind, the complications of completion thyroidectomy may be much worse than the benefit you can get especially the parathyroid and the nerve problem. Now, what is important, and this is what I call an isocelist triangle. There must be a good understanding between the surgeon, the endocrinologist, and the patient. And when we talk about the patient, remember, it's not the patient alone. It's the family, it's the neighbor, it's the patient's gardener, because they are going to tell that you are not getting complete treatment Go and get radioactive iodine because that will tell you if your tumor has gone somewhere else or not. We do need the studies in future about the quality of life, the differences between lobectomy and total thyroidectomy. But whatever is published, I'm convinced that lobectomy has the best quality of life. Keep in mind, the complications of thyroid surgery are directly proportional to the extent of surgery and inversely proportional to the surgeon experience. What about the completion thyroidectomy when we have nodules on the other side? If you see a nodule on the other side before lobectomy, think what I need to do. Now I'm going to make it very simple. If it is below five, centi five millimeter, you can practically neglect the other node. If it is between five and 10 millimeter, I would do some workup get appropriate imaging study and consider a needle biopsy. If it is more than 10 millimeter and the patient is young, I know this will probably grow over a period of time and patient will come for completion thyroidectomy. And I may consider total thyroidectomy today unless the patient understands that we could follow this tiny nodule on the other side. There's always a debate when the patient has Hashimoto's thyroiditis is their quality of life not good because they have Hashimoto thyroiditis? I don't have right answers. I don't know. But there is a group of surgeons and endocrinologists who feel that the patient's quality of life may get better if you do a total thyroidectomy in Hashimoto thyroiditis. I really don't have an answer. I think we need to study this more in prospective studies. Now, there is always a question, and as I mentioned before, is there a microscopic cancer on the other side? Yes, 10% of the patients will have microscopic cancer, but that has no clinical basis or relevance in the management of patients for completion thyroidectomy. When we talk about extrathyroid extension, we need to divide between minor and major. The minor, minor is very common. We see it in about 25 to 30% of the patients, but the major extension that the surgeon appreciates at the time of surgery or on imaging studies is very important. What is the best timing of completion thyroidectomy? 
and there's a lot of debate about it. Most of us will feel, wait for two to three months, let the swelling subside, let the wound heal, let the scarring go down and do a completion thyroidectomy so that there is no uh, inflamed tissue and the surgery is much more easy. So when I was at Downstate, there was a surgeon, Bernie Gardner, he would believe uh, in getting expedited histopathology report. I'll give you an example. He would do the surgery on Wednesday, will get the pathology report with the expedited fashion from the pathology department, which they can give in 24 hours. And if it is cancer, Friday he will go back to the surgery for the second surgery. And I think you could do this probably up to a week. After that, there is inflammatory response and may be very difficult. And if you do believe that you can get the expedited report, you may consider surgery within 48 to 72 hours. So I won't go into the details. I think we already talked about this. There's always a debate. The final report comes back as poorly differentiated cancer. You've got an 80-year-old patient poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. I don't think we need to argue about completion thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine because the radioactive iodine does not help in patients with poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. And most of those could be easily followed with appropriate follow-up imaging studies and occasionally a PET scan. What about medical thyroidectomy? This is something very interesting. This has been published from Boston. You can ablate the opposite lobe in selected patients. You can give 70 millicurie today and the opposite lobe will be uh, ablated over a period of six months. It is a little complicated, but let's say a patient has a paralyzed vocal cord on the ipsilateral side. And you do believe that this patient needs completion thyroidectomy, but you don't have feelings, good feeling that I want to go back and do the opposite side. I think you can do medical thyroidectomy with radioactive iodine. So going back to the philosophy, avoid over treatment and treatment related medical or surgical problems or surgical complications. What happens to the other lobe is the important subject when we talk about thyroid lobectomy. What are the risks of keeping opposite lobe like developing nodules? And what is the likelihood that the patient may require radioactive iodine now or in future, which will lead to completion thyroidectomy? Now, Mike Tuttle, myself, and Dr. Zhang have published this. And this is very interesting. This was published in uh, 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 expert reviews. And this is very interesting. We need to look at the TR factors, some characteristics, patient characteristics, and medical team characteristics. And based on this, we can select out the patients for lobectomy. And we have looked at the appropriate patients, the ideal patients, and inappropriate patients. Please take a look at this paper. It is very interesting to define the criteria both for lobectomy and active surveillance. And the most important for a surgeon is intraoperative findings and postoperative pathology report. Based on this, if you adhere to these principles, the tumor characteristics, the patient and the medical team characteristics, the completion thyroidectomy is rarely required except for 5 to 10% of the patients and not 50% of the patients as some of the people have criticized the ATA guidelines. And to go back, who is the ideal patient? Small tumor, zero neck. You can develop the patient characteristics. Uh, again, you, we have to come back to the philosophy of life. Are you a minimalist or are you a maximalist? Are you worried about your blood glucose being 100 or are you worried about a small tumor with minor extratheral extension? And medical team characteristics, I think these are important findings. I'm not going to go in the details about the appropriate factors. Again, you will see these important uh, 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 factors, uh, what is appropriate, what is inappropriate. Again, here, you will find these inappropriate patients, to large tumor, uh, gross extratheral extension, and other factors which are related to the tumor, the patient, and the medical team. And based on this, I think you can do a proper selection of the patient for lobectomy. 
uh, and we can divide the patients into ideal, appropriate, and inappropriate, preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. If you understand this philosophy, the entire debate about completion thyroidectomy is, does not exist. You can make the best selection of treatment before, during, or after the surgical procedure. And based on this, we can conclude the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And this is very important. I'm just going to conclude in two minutes. What is the minimalistic approach for thyroid lobectomy? I think this is something that is important. It is not for every patient with low risk cancer. It is not for every patient and it is not for every clinician. We need to individualize the care of the patients, even whether you go for lobectomy or active surveillance. And the philosophy of this is dependent on the surgeon, the endocrinologist, and the entire institution, including our own philosophy in our own institution. I do hope in the last 39 minutes, I've not confused you. But if I confuse you, I think I did a good job because then Mark will invite me again to make sure I explain it again what I said last time and that will go back to my 20% rule. So I'm going to conclude by showing this slide. This was the paper I published in 1992, exactly 29 years back, completion thyroidectomy, a critical appraisal. This was published in surgery, presented in American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. And that time I developed this algorithm, the lobectomy and ismasectomy based on the factors that we know, which now we have defined much better, the pre-op factors, the intra-op factors, and the intra-op factors. So I'm going to conclude, what are my indications for completion thyroidectomy today? the post-operative adverse pathological features which will require radioactive iodine. If there is a suspicious nodule on the other side, the new development of suspicious nodules, development of lymph nodes, and the searching, and the last thing is the patient anxiety. And when the patient calls you three times or has gone and seen two other surgeons for their opinion, I think that's a patient who will require completion thyroidectomy because he or she will never be happy till the completion thyroidectomy is done. I'm going to show this slide, which I've shown many times, the debate about lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy or completion thyroidectomy keeps going on because this is the philosophy of life and surgery. Commonplace clinical problems are approached in a diametrically opposite ways by surgeons with similar training background, having read the same literature. But what do we do? We read the same literature. We have the same philosophy. We read the same analysis. But we interpret available information differently based on unique personal experience, region, and the most important thing in surgery is surgical prejudice. It is, this is the way I have been doing. I'm not going to change that. That's we, what we call surgical prejudice or surgical ego. If we put away our ego in the management of thyroid cancer, I think I will do, we will do much better for our patients, especially with low risk thyroid cancer and maintain the best quality of life for them. Thank you very much. Ashtok, thank you very much. That, uh, as always, uh, was truly outstanding and also, um, as always, extremely entertaining. Uh, so I appreciate that. I was waiting for the picture of you in the taxi cab at the end, and um, uh, you disappointed me. Perhaps you can search and uh, pull that up for us. Um, really uh, a wonderful lecture and, um, and extremely well supported. I think one of the big challenges here in my mind is really counseling the patient and the family. And as you, as you alluded to, many patients do come in with their own biases, their own fears, 
um, and just say, I want this whole thing out. I don't want to have to worry about this. Do you, how often do you end up spending time and how do you do that to undo a pre, um, sort of pre-visit uh, prejudice that the patient uh, brings to the table? They just want their thyroid out and they don't want to have to worry about it again. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And we face this every time. That's why I said it is not thyroid consultation, it is confrontation. Now, most of the people either read it in uh, Google or they have already seen somebody or their cousin had radioactive iodine. And I think that becomes a little difficult. What we do is we tell them that, look, if you are my daughter, this is what I would do. And one of the good thing at Memorial is our endocrinologists who are actively involved in thyroid cancer practically have the same philosophy. So after the surgery, they won't get a different opinion. And we don't make final decision with the patient or the family on day one. We tell them, okay, let me get our own ultrasound. We get our own CAT scan. And when they come back, we re-emphasize. Now, have we done a completion thyroidectomy for anxiety? Yes. We have done that. When the patient threatens to me that if you don't operate, I'll go back to my Arkan, I'll say, sure, I'll do it. You know, <laughs> But that's uh, something that we would be, as we say, out of the box. And yes, about 10% of the people won't agree with us. They will say, just take it out. I don't want to think about it. But then I, we go through the details of the quality of life and the complications. And I would say about 80% of the people will agree with us. Great. Um, so there are a number of, um, uh, of questions regarding that contralateral nodule that you alluded to. Yeah. Um, it, it always um, comes up in conversations that um, how can you be sure that that's not cancer? And Correct. so how do you, even in the less than five millimeter nodule and somebody who knows that there, there's a risk for multifocality um, and contralateral disease, how do, you, how do you reconcile that um, for the patient who you say, I really don't want to, um, to biopsy that, and I don't want to talk into having that one out, that lobe yeah. out? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So number one, we always tell the patient if there is a nodule. So we tell the patient, look, there is a tiny nodule on the other side. I'll be happy to continue to monitor you. Hopefully it will not get better. And what I tell them, I think I have a five millimeter nodule. Probably my wife has a five millimeter nodule. Don't worry about it. And you can look into the eyes of the patient and say, she's agreeing with you or she understands you. Below five millimeter, I tell them that it is very difficult to get a good biopsy. Between five to 10 millimeter, I tell them that, look, there is a tiny nodule. If you feel uncomfortable, I'll prove that it is benign or malignant and then act upon that accordingly. If it is 10 millimeter nodule or more and patient is young, I know eventually it will become 15 and 20. So I'm a little more lenient towards total thyroidectomy. But what is important is you must tell the patient there is a tiny nodule so that she doesn't get upset later on that you didn't tell me there was a tiny nodule on the other side. Great. So, you know, I think one of the um, perhaps um, uh, and, and this is certainly important um, in this discussion, is the, the fact that the contralateral lobe, even though when you're doing a lobectomy, an isthmusectomy, um, you don't enter the opposite compartment, I'm always impressed by how much inflammation there is on that other side, um, that there is this outpouring of, re of an inflammatory response that it's never quite the same, even though the literature supports the safety of completion of thyroidectomy. I just, I wish I could put up a barrier um, and tell the body not to do anything to that other compartment. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? And, uh, um, you know, uh, so why don't you just, if I can let you talk through that. That's sure. That's, that's great, you know. Now we have to realize that ultrasound has changed our philosophy of evaluating the thyroid. During my training, we would go on the capsule of the opposite lobe and try to feel it. You don't need to do that anymore because the ultrasound will define you very well. There is a nodule or no nodule. Now, if you really want to feel, you don't go under the strap muscles. You can feel the thyroid through the strap muscles. And I think Janice Pasika has written a paper on this that don't evaluate the opposite lobe with the operating room. 
dissecting on the capsule of the thyroid. And your initial statement, yes, there is an inflammatory response. There are many papers in the literature showing that the completion thyroidectomy does not have increased incidence of complications, but I'm convinced that there is a higher difficulties in doing a completion thyroidectomy, the scarring, the fibrosis, and the muscle adhering to the thyroid. So number one, if your ultrasound does not show anything, don't explore the other side. And I, ultrasound is a very good strategy in evaluating the thyroid nodules. Great. Um, can you can you talk just a little bit about um, your uh, your own philosophy in the situation where you know you've got high risk cancer that you've lost um, signal um, in your dissection and how you make that decision. Oftentimes um, in patients with, um, you know, who have a, a aggressive disease, um, if we take out the poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, but patients with um, high risk nodal disease, um, do you feel comfortable waiting for that um, nerve, to, that vocal cord to recover um, for three to four, two to three, four months? Um, or will you go to the other side and uh, dissect out that, uh, that lobe? What's your own personal philosophy in that? Mark, this is not a billion, million dollar question. It's a trillion dollar question. And I'll give you my own philosophies. Uh, these are my philosophies. These are not international guidelines. If you find, let's say you're operating on a right-sided thyroid tumor, which is six centimeters. At the time of surgery, you see 10 lymph nodes adhering to the nerve. And you know deep in your heart, this patient needs a total thyroidectomy. When I see that the nerve is stuck to the, to the uh, uh, tumor, primary or the nodes, I would immediately go on the other side because I know the risk of losing signal on this right side, which is a high risk, is about 25% or 30%. That I'm not talking about injuring the nerve permanently. I'm talking about losing the signal. That means you, the, the likelihood of aborting surgery, according to the guidelines or the intraoperative ethics is about 30%. Your fellow or resident is going to say, Sir, you cannot go back, go on the other side, because if you injure the other side, patient will wake up with tracheostomy. So I would, I would leave that one side behind, go on the other side, take the risk of one or two percent losing the signal on the other side, which is much less than 30 percent, and do the lobectomy on the other side, and then come back and do the in, intense dissection that you need. The other thing is, in the heart of this heart, the surgeon knows when he has dissected, is this nerve just closely adherent or intimately married to the tumor where the intense dissection will paralyze the nerve completely and will not come back? If that is your thinking, I would go on the other side at the same time because I know in three months the nerve is not going to come back and I will be delaying the surgery unnecessarily. But again, remember, the nerve monitoring does raise some ethical issues. Because you lose the signal, you go, as a surgeon, you go on the other side, your resident or the fellow is going to say to the rest of the world, he went on the other side, having lost the signal on one side. And that becomes a negative um, point for your decision making. So my philosophy is use the rule of 20% against 2% and make a decision. Now, there are many surgeons, especially in Spain, who would know that the nerve is in, intact, but we have lost the signal, they feel comfortable going on the other side. A lot of that depends upon the judgment about your comfort level. And the, when you go on the other side with a loss of signal on one side, at the same time, if you're going, be extremely cautious and do a surgical procedure which will not give any irritation or major exposure of the nerve. I hope that answers some of the complicated question you have raised. Yeah, I, I um, and I think it's uh, this is valuable insight. Um, I think that the difficult thing, though, is to go to the opposite side as your initial dissection in the complicated, high-risk um, 
uh, um, situation. And if by chance you lose that signal and you decide you're not going to go to the other side, you've left this tumor in place and you yep. go out to talk to the family and, and you explain, I think that's an incredibly difficult conversation to have. You're absolutely correct. Many of the, you know, I have done this on several occasions, the 20% against 2% rule. And the fellow or the resident has always asked me, Dr. Shah, you are going on the other side. What if you lose the signal on the other side? And there are, I have two answers. Either take a gun and shoot yourself <laughs> or retire the same day. I mean, that's a great question. And again, you know, a lot of this will depend. The easiest thing, no brainer, just close the patient, bring the patient back to the operating room. But you know at the time of surgery, this nerve is totally um, kind of damaged by the tumor. It's not going to come back, do this operation same time. Take some risk, take some uh, understanding with the family. And that's where the discussion with the family preoperatively comes. And again, we never talk about tracheostomy as a, as a decision making, but some of these high risk patients, we may have to tell them that, look, I'll do my best, but still there is some risk. Great. Can I just ask you to, um, you, you put up a number of series of, um, with a long, long term management on risk of recurrence in lobectomy. And yeah. certainly um, the Mayo Clinic. Uh, experience um, that uh, Ian Hay published um, now several years uh, back, um, looking over a 50-year period. Could yeah. you just comment on reconciling that um, data, which shows a significant um, increase in risk from lobectomy versus um, uh, total thyroidectomy, how that fits into um, your thoughts here? I think that's the same um, um, uh, kind of strategy that when Carl Blimoria published the paper from NCDB data and Jatin Shah wrote a very nice letter to the editor uh, re-analyzing or revisiting the entire data. When we talk about the recurrence in the low risk patient, we need to go back to the pathology. And these are the patients who clearly will be benefited with total thyroidectomy. When the Mayo Clinic analyzed the data, I don't think they went in the granularity of the patients who recurred. And the same thing happened with the NCDB data. As a matter of fact, when the NCDB data was published, the ATA guidelines in 2009 promulgated the philosophy of total thyroidectomy for tumors above one centimeter. And that was one paper they used in decision making, the similar like what you talked about the Mayo Clinic data. But if you go in the details of the data, you will be able to analyze certain patients who are at low risk thyroid cancer patient, but high risk for recurrence or development of disease on the other side. I think you can separate that group. When we wrote a paper on the low risk thyroid cancer in the American uh, Annals of Surgical Oncology, I'll give you some analysis. I was reviewing the data on 400 patients, a low risk patients, lobectomy, total thyroidectomy, no outcome difference. Four patients died of low risk thyroid cancer. And I said, something is not right here. I'm not interested in 396 patients who did well. Let's go back to these four patients again and see why they died. Believe me, they were all aggressive pathological cancers, poorly differentiated. At that time, we didn't understand that because we didn't have the basic understanding of the aggressive nature of the pathology. We were dividing them into uh, classical, moderately differentiated, et cetera. But now we know who are the truly high risk in the low risk group. And if you separate that group, the data is very clean. These patients will do very well with the risk of recurrence, which is very low. And that's why our incidence of completion thyroidectomy in this group is less than 10%. Only 5% for the tumor reasons and 5% for the psychological reasons of the patient. Great. I'm going to ask you just to um, project into the future here and see if you um, feel that there will come a time where molecular analysis is going to truly influence the approach to um, 
the extent of thyroid surgery and um, do you think those studies are ever going to get done? I have a feeling that the insurance companies have um, are going to be um, make that a difficult leap. But do you think that that time will come? Um, you know, let, let me put it two ways. Will that time come? Probably yes. When will that come? When there are more and more prospective studies done, somebody's going to get RO1 uh, uh, funding for analyzing the low risk patients with high risk mutations. That is going to happen. Or the data that we have from our low risk patients or the Bethesda 3 and 4, where there is a high risk mutation. But there are two aspects here. The high risk mutation, like the BRAF and TERT, is quite rare in the low risk cancer, number one. Number two, that is common in older patients. Now, would I use that in the decision making today? Probably not, unless they are both BRAF and TERD positive. Because we know from whatever little data we have that those are probably more aggressive. And I might consider total thyroidectomy or push myself to do a total thyroidectomy based on this molecular analysis. Would I make a million dollar change? No. Now, if you look at the world data, it is interesting to look at it. If you look at the Chinese data, where they have done a large number of preoperative evaluation with BRAF, they have, their BRAF positivity is 87%. That is almost every patient has BRAF positivity. So that has no meaning. It is not going to help us. We don't do routinely, but if we do do that, we'll be able to get some analysis as to how many of our low risk patients are BRAF positive and TERT positive and where we have done lobectomy if we can follow. Now that's a long-term study. It's going to take a tremendous undertaking. Would I use it today for prognosis? Probably not. But if BRAF and TERT are positive, I may be more inclined to do a total thyroidectomy and RAI. Great. Thank you. Ashok, we've pushed the limits uh, that of time that allows. Um, I have to finish up with one last question that 80% of our attendees this morning have asked. Everybody wants to know how you got that stimulus check um, as quickly as you did. And do you have any words of advice to the rest of us? If your name is Ashok Shah, you will get the check. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. It Thank was wonderful. You, Ashok. Really appreciate it. Wonderful lecture. Um, and um, everybody have a great day and hope you'll join us again next week here. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you.